Welcome to another edition of the Sim Racing Garage. I'm Barry Rowland. In this episode, we'll be reviewing the new Prime cockpit from the guys at GT Omega Racing, built using aluminum profiles and some other custom parts. This is part one, or the build video, where I go through the complete assembly process. In part two, called the setup, we will be fitting the Prime with proper Sim Racing hardware and putting it through the usual SRG testing process. So, Let's get to it. Now we'll take a look at the profiles and the hardware we're going to be using in this build. This is a 40 series profile, but it does have some differences from what I would call the normal 40 series I'm used to using and stuff that comes from Europe. And even stuff that comes from Europe can be a little different. But I'll show you the differences from and why we're using the hardware we're using when we get there. We have four different sizes here. We have the single 4040, which means it's 40 millimeters by 40 millimeters square. And we have a double, which is also known as a 40 by 80. We have a triple 40 by 120 and the big one, the 40, 160. Now, these pieces here, the doubles and the singles, have a little bit different profile on them than the bigger pieces, the 120 and the 160 over here. And I'm going to use a, what they call a light, at least when they sell me this stuff, that's what they call it, 40 series profile as an example. And if you notice this one, it has some pretty big areas in here where the holes are that run the whole length of the profile in, in the extrusion, which gives it good support. And they make lighter versions of this, though. And to make it lighter, I'm showing you a little comparison here. What they'll do is make it thinner in the middle. By how much? Take a look at it there. So you can see there's a big difference in the centers. And there's also, I wanted to show you while I have this up here, the channels themselves, the ones on this profile for the prime cockpit are deeper than the ones on the 40 series that's on top of it. Which means my T-nuts for the 40 series won't work as far as the spring part of it and holding them still. And I'll, I'll show you that in a minute. But again, you can see how much thinner the middle is compared to this piece. Now when we get to the 120s and up, it gets more like this is. Now we're, we're looking more like the same, right? Although the channels are the same. The channels underneath are deeper than the ones on top. And they're a little bit square. See how more square they are at the bottom than the ones on the top? But other than that, you know, these look pretty close to the same. Even the holes here in these side channel supports look pretty much the same to me. Just deeper channels. So those are the differences from normal 40 series. And the reason I'm showing you this is I've got a lot of these laying around, these spring ball T-nuts, call them roll-in spring balls. And that's because they have this little spring ball in it. And that has a spring underneath it, provides tension. So when I put this in the channel, it doesn't go anywhere. It won't fall out. And of course, because of the way it's shaped, I can take it and roll it in. And that means just take the spring ball t-nut and roll that baby in like that take my fingers and manipulate it over to where the little bits fit in the channel and you're done so that's got those grooves in there that match the channel which i like now this is kind of the same but it doesn't have a spring ball on it this has the grooves on it again which are nice because it locks it into the channel but this uses a different type of spring mechanism and that's this little leafy metal part here so that's spring steel. I press on it, it just springs back and forth. When we take that and put it in the channel, and this is a little bit trickier because see the shape of this? It has a U in it. So we basically have two tabs here. You gotta make sure each tab clears as you push it in. And I'll just kind of take it and roll the first tab in like that. And then I have to follow it with my finger on the bottom to get that other tab in. No big deal. That's just the process that you have to do or it'll hang and you won't be able to get it in. So it won't slide in as easily as, say, a spring ball T-nut if you already had it attached to something. Now, you can also take this and sp spin it in or twist it in so that if you have something on either side of your profile on your cockpit, you don't have to worry about taking things apart to get your T-nuts in. So I'll take this. Let me put it in this one, I guess. And all I'm going to do is push it in with this edge front first. So the tabs are kind of hanging out like that. I'll just press this in and then I'll try to twist it in the channel just like I did in the spring T-nut. So 
but this is a little bit trickier because of the tabs on it, but not much. And sometimes it helps to push it back and forth as I'm trying to twist it into the channel and get it to compress. You're basically trying to compress that leaf spring so this edge will slip past the lip, just like that. And then you can work it in with your fingers a little bit, and there you go. So we're doing the, essentially the same thing that we're doing with the spring ball, but we have a leaf on it, and I'll show you the leaf there. And you can see it's a little bit squared off on the bottom here to catch that leaf, even though it kind of sits there in the middle. And there's no groove in the middle for it to lock into. If you look over here on this one, there's really no groove or anything like that. Some, some of these extrusions have little grooves in there that actually catch that leaf spring. But anyway, it's achieving the purpose it's supposed to, right? So if I take the same 40 series, though, spring ball T-nut that I normally have and try to put this in here, it's just the channel is too deep for it. I put it in, it doesn't, the spring ball has no effect. It just kind of sits there. I can keep it from sliding away. See how much, see how shallow that is compared to the depth of the channel. So it doesn't work that way. Even though I could still use this if I attached it to something already, like a bracket or something, and just slide it in. And then just tighten it down. But I couldn't, you know, if I tried to do this like I just did that twist one in, I could get it in past the channel. It does still squeeze past the channel, which is kind of nice. But as soon as I get it past that and try to wiggle it around to get it to come up and bite, it won't because it's too shallow. And just slide right back out. Okay, so that's the differences as far as that goes. Now we have some corner brackets, and these look more familiar than as I'm used to seeing, but these are black. This is nice. It has a black, it looks like it's painted. I wouldn't call that anodization. And they are tabbed units. Again, very nice. You can see the two tabs there. And these tabs are to keep it from twisting around. I call them anti-twist tabs. You have them both sides. You can see a little better against my white background there. And there's a big bag of these, and then there's a small bag with like four of these in it. And the difference is the ones that have the four, they remove the tabs on one side. See them go? They're off. At least not all the way off, but that was the intent when they did it. But you can see there's still tabs here. And the tabs, of course, are just to lock in the channels. And I can use this one because it's the same channel size. And keep it from twisting around when it goes in there. All right, so it just makes it a more secure connection when we bolt everything down tight, right? It keeps it from twisting. And especially in a motion system, I like building with this stuff. Because it's going to have a lot of twisting torque on it. Which, by the way, I might mount a motion system to this just to see how it handles it after we get it built. But yeah, so they pull the tabs off. These are going to be used in a situation where if we have a piece that is crossing another piece like this, then these bottom tabs here that weren't broken off, these tabs, and we have no tabs over here, will fit right in this channel like this, right? And we still have the anti-twist element, but then because we have this crossing piece, we have to cut those tabs off so it'll flat, go flat and flush up against this piece here that I'm crossing against. Or it's going perpendicular. The channels are perpendicular to each other. That's what you have to do. Now, they did cut these off or break them off because all you have to do is get a screwdriver in here. On these, it's very easy to get these off. Screwdriver down that little piece there. Pry up on it and it pops off. No big deal. And you can see they've already done that, like I said before. But if you'll notice, it's... They didn't get it all the way off. See that? See how it's sitting proud a little bit there? Which means it's not going to sit flush against my crossing piece of profile. So I'm going to have to get a file and file that down. And sometimes when you break them off, that happens. And you have to do it anyway. It's just part of the tab system, it seems like, on these things. But yeah, I wouldn't leave, I'm not going to leave that there like that. And I wish they had, you know, they should have filed that down before they went and painted it again. But yeah, it is what it is. Not hard to deal with, and we'll take care of that. And I'll check the others to make sure they're nice and flat. The back one broke off pretty cleanly. As you can see, there's no problem with anything sticking up from there. Right. And we're going to have M8 bolts. These are 16 millimeters as far as the thread goes. These are 16 millimeters long. They are the socket head caps. These are steel. And they have an M6 or 6 millimeter hex size to it. This is an M8 type thread. And it's, they got the nice little grips on them. See that little... The line's going up around there, which makes it a little easier to grip when you're trying to finger tighten it versus a smooth one. If you ever get into a situation where it's really tight, where you're trying to get in there and your fingers are slipping around on the thing, you can't get it to go in, these are kind of nice to have. 
So, yeah, I do like to see in that kind of stuff. And that's it, really. <laughs> There's not going to be anything else to talk about. We might as well just go ahead, get these profiles on the floor and start putting things together. So we're going to start assembling the cockpit. We'll start with our four base pieces, and they are the 40 by 160 series. And these are pretty massive as far as the long pieces go. They're 1,370 millimeters long, or about 54 inches, and they come in at 14 pounds, 6.5 ounces, or 6.5 kilos. So definitely a good, heavy, stout piece of metal. And the shorter piece over here, it comes in at 500 millimeters, or around 19 and 3 quarter inches. And it weighs about, see, I think it came in at like 5 pounds, 4 ounces, or 2.38 kilo. So once we have it all put together, it's going to have a little bit of weight to it. Now we're going to be using these corner brackets that came with the kit. And these are the corner brackets that have the little tabs on them on both sides. If you remember, four of these brackets had these tabs broken off already. But yeah, you want the ones that have the tabs on both sides because we're going to be putting it into the channel and the other piece is going to be coming right behind it and we'll be able to match those tabs so we have a nice anti-twist solution when we put it all together. We're going to be using the spring or leaf spring type of T-nut here, this M8 T-nut. You can see I've already pre-staged some in the big side piece, longitudinal piece, and we're going to be using these M8 bolts here. And that is an M6 hex size on this, and they're 16 millimeters long in the thread. They do have some longer ones in the kit, and that's why I mentioned the 16 millimeters. Very simple what I'm going to do here. I'm going to pre-stage this stuff. Now, of course, there's a couple of ways to go about getting this done. You can follow the manual to the letter if you want, or just do your own thing. I prefer to do it my own thing. <laughs> and that is, you can see how I've pre-staged this side piece. I've already got my corner brackets in, and it's going to just sit right here on the longer pieces and do its spreading action for 500 millimeters. Now, you could take the brackets and put it on this piece first, if that's what you want to do, or build build it before you move it over there. Like I said, there's different ways to get this done, and this is just the way I'm going to do it, because I'm just going to come in and set these spreader pieces down. I'll have my long pieces all along the side, and I just kind of push them up against there, and of course the T-nuts are already in them, and adjust as I do that, and then be able to just bolt them together and be done with it. So we're going to take it over to the floor now and see how it goes. So now that I have the profiles laid out the way I want, I've already connected these ends of our spreader profiles very loosely. You can see they can still move around very easily. And just to demonstrate how I did this, now it's just a matter of kind of pushing this over to these other brackets. And if you'll see, I pre-staged the T-nuts. They're already in here. I want to make sure you have them forward enough of the brackets. So I, if anything, I want to be, have to push them back towards the brackets, then have to come out and try to spread them back forward. Like if I had them back here, it would have been harder to get back here and move them once they're up there. Anyway, we've got our four pieces of bolts here, our socket head caps. And again, these are the M8, 16 millimeters long. And yeah, this is an M6 wrench size on it. So what I usually do is just go ahead and kind of slide it up here. And the reason I do it this way, I have complete control. I'm not, I don't have anything pre-assembled trying to move it around. And these are heavy pieces, so it makes it a little easier to... I'm also trying to keep from scratching things up <laughs> at every chance that I get. And yeah, it's just a matter of getting it like this. Now I can actually lean down and take a look at how these nuts are lining up, the T-nuts. And I'm not worried about the distance between these two yet. And I'll get to that in a minute, how I'm going to handle that. But I'm just going to kind of look down in here, see where they are, and see if I can get the bolt in there and get it started. And it looks like I am. These T-nuts, I've been using them, they're not, some of them aren't threaded quite as well as they should be, and that's the quality control thing. I haven't had to take the tap out yet and chase the threads, but they haven't been as good as I would have liked them to be. Now, this one's a little bit further in, so I'm just going to move this a little bit. And again, you can just bump this with your hand, no big deal. Get in there and kind of feel around where it's at. That one started pretty good. And then we'll come to our back ones in here. Take a look at the top one. That's pretty much lined up. 
see if I can scoot this a little bit closer. And I'm also, remember, we have the tabs on the back of these brackets. So I'm also watching how those are lining up to make sure I don't have any issues there to get them close. Even though these bolts will pull them in. I'm going to go ahead and do this bottom one first. Yeah, it's starting pretty good. And we got one more to go. That's the guy up here. And we'll get that started. And then I'll come in with my M6 wrench. And slowly pull this in a little bit and watch where I'm at. Now on the back here, I want to make sure that this piece is flush with the end of this piece. It can actually be a little bit further in if you want it to be. Because remember, we're going to put a cap, plastic cap on the back of this. And it's going to be sticking out a few millimeters. So that would make it absolutely flush if I left it out a little bit. But, you know, it depends on what you want to do. There's really no right way to do that, I don't think. I wouldn't call one way or the other right. As long as you got it done. I'm going to make them flush. Because it just allows me to make sure everything's looking like it should. And straight up and down. And the cool thing about these profile rigs is, if the quality control is there, obviously, that was a little hung there, that these 90 degree brackets, if you pull them in and alternate the way you tighten them, it'll pull them in and it should be pretty darn square as far as the box that you're building here. So that's good enough for now. I'm going to start bringing the bottom one in. Again, I'm watching down, straight down here what's going on with those tabs and make sure they're going into the grooves like they should. And I am happy with the progress so far. I'm kind of happy. I could change it any minute though. <laughs> and these are loose, so the brackets are being pulled over here. They're not real tight here, so it allows them to move. So I'm going to go ahead and just touch tight these on the back here. It's important to get the back, I think, lined up first because that's where everything's mating back here and you want everything to look nice and flush. And then we can do whatever we want to with this one as far as getting our distance right. And I'm going to go over here and do the same thing. You guys won't be able to see that very well. And I also like to get the T-nuts pushed all the way out so that these bolt heads are on the furthest part of the brackets as I'm putting them on. And sometimes they can get a little stiff, especially these leaf spring ones. I can get in there and tap it a little bit though inside the channel to make it move a little easier. These are just little tips I've given you here from building so many of these things. And again, make sure my screws aren't too tight there so that they pull in nice. Again, constantly watching here how my back is looking. Looks pretty good there. Looking good there. You can always tap it if you got something soft you don't want to mar your finish and see how that works. So I'm going to leave this kind of snugged up a little bit. Go ahead and get these guys, give them a turn. And that way my back, I know, is where I want it to be. So then it's up to me coming up to the front piece and adjusting that for the length that I need. Because remember, we have these pieces here, a profile, that we're going to be using as our seat rails. And I can see right now on the back here when that's flush, that the front, you know, again, you don't have to be perfectly precise with this stuff. My knee pad over here. But I like to be precise. And I can see I'm a little short here. This piece here, the middle piece, needs to come over. So I'm just going to kind of tap that in the middle a little bit until I think it's where I want it to be. Then I'll come over a little bit too far. Looks good. I'll come over on this side, and again, using the same length or piece, I can determine how good I am here. And boy, that looks pretty good. Yeah, that looks pretty good. So, I'll take it off. I'll go ahead and tighten this side up first. Again, I'm moving my T-nut all the way out to the end of the bracket. Go ahead and let it pull in. I'm not going to do it real tight yet, because I don't know if, if you try to do it real tight, then you try to tighten up the other way. All of a sudden, you're pulling it out of skew. Do the same thing over here. Again, watching my tabs get pulled into the channel like they should. Looks good. 
I like the tab brackets, as I've said before. It's really a nice piece to have on something on a rig, even though it's a static rig, but especially when you put motion on a rig because you have all these twisting torque on, these, on the frame itself. And I'm not going to get this super tight either because remember, we still had to put the pedal tray in, and I don't tighten all this down real hard until I get the pedal tray in because then it might be hard to get the pedal tray in and you're scratching everything up trying to squeeze it in between there. So yeah, I always make sure once I pull everything together and it looks right to me, then I'll always come back and make it a little loose because I don't want it, I want it to be able to spread out a little bit. All right, that was good. I'm going to make sure I got them loose over here. Again, if I need to spread out, these brackets can move outwards this way. All right, I'm going to check my runner again, my little seat bracket holder. That's looking pretty. And right here, that looks pretty too. Now I could get the ruler out and do an X measurement to make sure this is a perfectly square box. But again, these brackets, if you tighten them in the right sequence, should do that for you. So I really don't worry about it too much. What I make sure is everything as far as this corner is the same length, or this side and this side are the same length apart as this side. And then you're pretty much done anyway. So what we'll do next is get to the pedal tray. So this is the pedal tray that we'll be mounting. And it goes this way, with this being the front and this being the back. Originally, I thought it was going this way because you could mount like three individual pedals this way, and but you can't really do it this way. But most pedal sets these days will come with their own base plate. So you can mount the base plate. And of course, you could always drill a hole if you need to, right? But I, I just thought it was a little curious the way they laid this out. Now, this is about three mil or eighth inch thick steel plate. It's been stamped. It's got a reinforcement piece going underneath it. I'll flip it around and show that to you. And there it is. So it's more towards the front than it is towards the back. And the curious thing about this, when I was looking at it, it's obviously it's welded. You can see the spot welds on there. These are nice welds. But if you, if, when I was handling it, I dropped it and it made some noise. Hear that? There it is. <laughs> Even though it's got all these welds in it, it sounds like it's loose. And I'm not sure why. It might be a piece of the welding, what we call slag, got into the channel here and, and it's just stuck in there a little bit and makes it rattle. I don't know. but Or maybe it's because it's a thin plate here and there's a weld here and here and there's enough gap in here for the metal to actually rattle up against it. But in use, we're never going to notice that. And I'm just curious that I, I like to show you guys everything that I find when I'm looking at this stuff. Again, it's well done on the inside, too. I believe this is painted from what I can see where the scratches are. It looks like it's a paint. It's definitely not powder coat. And, yeah, it's, it's a pretty decent looking tray, I guess. As long as it gets the job done, right? Now, we will be mounting this by using a T-nut. Let me turn around this way. Easier to see. A T-nut and... A bolt will go into the top channel of our 40 by 160 profiles that make up the base. And back here, a bolt is going to go into one of these brackets. Let me pull this back here. And this bracket is going to be sitting like this on top of the 4160 profile. So we'll have a couple of, got two holes here. So we'll have a couple of T nuts in there holding this down. And this is going to give us our angle adjustment. And you can see the slot in there is so that as we move this up, the bolt can still stay in there. So that gives us our angle adjustment and that slot is so no matter which slot we're in off of this bracket, it should be able to accommodate the bolt. So that's how that's going to work. The only thing I'd see about this is I would have liked to seen element here of adjustability for the height. And right now there is none for that. You could actually drop this part lower into like the second channel of one of those 160 pieces, or both of them, obviously. And, but still, this bottom, that would just make this bottom kick up then. Then you would have an angle because it, this can't go any lower than that. However, I'm thinking that you could forego this bracket and just take it off and this put this like in the second slot with two bolts on the back here and the T-nuts in the 160 profile, and just drop it down 40 millimeters, and that way it can be low enough. If 
you don't need any angle on your pedals. <laughs> so if you need angle, that you can't do that either. So, or yeah, you just couldn't do that. You could put maybe the back, this part in the top channel, and then on the channel underneath it, 40 millimeters apart on the centers, you could put this one in. I mean, there's probably ways to get this done. And I just, again, I'm kind of thinking out loud when I'm looking at this stuff on how best, how you could do something if a situation arises where you're just going to need it lower than it is. But anyway, this is the way it's going to work. It's pretty simple. We're going to go over and install it and see what it looks like. As you can see, I have the pedal tray attached now, and it's not in the configuration that the manual says to have it in. Remember, this is supposed to have an angle adjustment in it, and I have it sitting flat because of the pedals I'm going to be using. This is the bracket that we put on the side. I'm going to show you guys some clips while I'm talking about this. And it's pretty easy to do. I just pre-installed the T-nuts and then came back in with the bracket and the M8 bolts. Just attach those. Pretty simple stuff here. And screw those on. And, of course, do it to the other side. And once that's done, then I went ahead and put a T-nut on the top channel of the profile so that it would service the front bolts, the M8 bolts that go in the front. And once I had those installed, then it was time to come back and install the back part at whatever angle. And you can see there's different angles that we can use here. And I just chose an arbitrary angle at this point just to show you the function of it. There is a different bolt that is used here. It is a 20 millimeter long M8 bolt. And it came attached to this nut. And I'll give you some close-up shots of this stuff. And this nut has serrations on it. So it digs into the metal when you tighten it down. It's, it's kind of a lock nut, if you will. So yeah, that's what you use on the brackets that adjust for the angle. And you can see I'm installing it here. Very simple stuff at the end of the day. Now, as you can see, like I said before, I don't have mine configured that way because the pedals I'm going to use don't need any rake as far as bringing the angle up on it. Now, if I was using like a Thrustmaster or a Logitech or a Fanatec, something like that, then yeah, I would want some angle on this because I like my pedals presented to my feet straight like this, not at an angle where I'm pushing down like this. It's better for me when I'm like this. And the pedals I'm using are a higher end set of pedals that take a lot of force as far as you can really bang on them hard. And that's, I wanted to use that pedal set for this cockpit so I could put some stress on it and see how this pedal tray reacts. My first impressions of the pedal tray are when it's mounted, that it will probably get the job done, but I would have liked to have seen some way to have a height adjustment in this pedal tray. And something a little more sturdy maybe than what we have here. But again, we won't know for sure until I have a heavy duty type of pedals on here that will have a stiff brake pedal on it. And yeah, so we'll have to see once I get everything bolted up. But this is the way I'm gonna run the pedal tray. And it is kind of nice that we can run it any way we want to at an angle or we just go ahead and sit it flat here. But again, I would have liked to have seen some kind of an elevation adjustment available in this solution. And maybe later on they'll come up with something like the P1X has a good adjustment for height. The Advanced Sim Racing one that I did a recent review on had an adjustment for pedal height in the tray. So I think it's kind of an essential thing to have now if you're going to be coming out with a cockpit. So we're ready to install the feet onto our chassis before it gets too heavy and I install anything else like the wheel uprights or the seat rails, things like that. I'm going to go ahead and install the feet. Now, I have to say that was a surprise when I pulled these feet out of the bag. It just doesn't, it seems out of place to me to be with a 40 series profile and a cockpit that is this heavy. Not that they won't take the weight. It just doesn't seem like the, the proper thing to have on this almost like an afterthought. Now you can see they're kind of smallish for a 40 series number one. I'll show you that. It's not even covering the whole profile. They're hard plastic. I'll put tap two of these together. So there's no give at all in these. So if you have kind of an unlevel floor somewhere, this is going to be shifting around on these because, well, first off, they're so short, there's not going to be much room for any kind of adjustability. Secondly, they're hard plastic, so there's no give or flex on the floor. If they're sitting on the floor, yeah, they're just going to, it's just hard plastic. Again, it seems a little bit out of sorts for the rest of the stuff that's in this kit. This is what comes with most 
80-20 profiles for feet. And this is a rubber. So it's actually got a little flex to it. Not much, but a little bit. And it has a reinforcing washer in there because it is rubber. It's embedded in the back part here when they do their molding process. But this seems a little bit more like where we should be, I think. So you can see it there. Covers the profile nicely. And again, it's rubber. So it's going to give a little bit. If you have a little bit of undulation in the floor, this will actually kind of mold to it a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. Much more than a hard piece of plastic will. So it's just one of those mysteries when I pull some parts out of kits that I get for different hardware for sim racing. And I just wonder what they were thinking. That this would be something that would be acceptable. I'm just, like I said... I'm just giving you the SRG's opinion on this. It seems like they could have done a better job on the feet, especially at the price points coming at the same price point as most other 80-20 cockpits made the same kind of way with the same kind of profiles. But anyway, we're going to go ahead and put them on, and we're going to use the T-nut, the little leaf spring T-nut we've been using all along the build so far. And yeah, just screw them in. Pretty simple thing. I'm going to go ahead and flip the cockpit on its side again. I want to do this before we put the wheel uprights on because it's going to be a little harder to do it once we weight it up with that kind of stuff. So what we'll do next is go ahead and put it on and see how it turns out. So we have the feet installed now to the bottom of this prime cockpit. And yeah, it's a pretty simple thing as you might imagine. Nothing hard to do here. You can see the T-nut down in behind there. And on the ends, I just slid in the T-nut on the end instead of doing the push-in installation of the T-nut. As you can see here, I'm pushing it in and putting the foot on. When I got to the middle, I went ahead and just inserted it. I'll show you a little clip of that. And you push it in and maneuver it to where it clips in with spring tension against the channel top, and you're good to go. And just install the foot. Yeah, real simple stuff. Nothing really magical going on here. So now that I have this done and I've got everything tightened up as far as the pedal tray and the supports on the back, the spreader supports, those 160s, then we'll go ahead and flip this back down and get rid of the cardboard. Don't need this anymore because we have the feet now. And yeah, we'll just go ahead and get on with the next segment. All right, so now we're ready to assemble the wheelbase uprights for the support for the wheelbase plate. And very simple thing here. This is the 40 by 120 series, and you can see it's got the solid pieces in the middle there. So this is a pretty stout piece like the 160s. We have a 10 millimeter Aluminum plate. This has been painted black. I can tell it's painted because, where is it? There it is. You can see right here. Oh, there it is. That piece there where it didn't get quite the paint that it needed. But then a screw is going to cover that, so it really doesn't matter, I guess. And yeah, this looks like a very familiar plate here. If you've ever seen a SimLab P1X cockpit. So yeah, it looks identical to what they're doing. It has its pluses and minuses using this kind of attachment point. Depends on who you ask. Now, of course, we're going to be putting our T-nuts in, the usual ones that we've been putting in, these spring leaf T-nuts, M8s. And we just slide them in the channel. In fact, I've already got a couple of them in there already, or a few of them. I'm just going to slide this one in real quick just to show you what's going on. Very simple stuff, like we've been doing throughout, if you've been following the video to this point. And then we're going to just kind of lay our plate up here. And remember, we have these countersunk holes, so we're going to be using these nice black M8 flathead bolts. And they have a 5 millimeter hex wrench size in there, which is in your kit. And it's a 16 millimeter long. These are the only ones in your kit, so it's hard to get these messed up. <laughs> and they're just going to sit straight on like that. Get them started. And I'll get my 5 mil wrench. Just spin it down. And... Look down straight and see where the other one is and do the same thing. And once we're done with it, it's going to look like this. And you can see how I've already got them all installed on this one. Now, these are a blind bolt kind of configuration. What I mean by that is once you install this upright, you will no longer have access to these bolts. So what you want to do before you install them is go ahead and get your final torque down on these bolts. If you don't, it'll come loose. And then once you have everything assembled and you're driving and it comes loose, then you have to take everything apart to get to these bolts again. So yeah, go ahead and torque them down good. All right, don't strip them or anything, but give them some good torque down because you don't want to have to come back and do it again. 
and also they're blind because, and I'll show you an example of what I'm talking about here, it's going to be mounted perpendicular, being the wheelbase upright that it is, going that way, and yeah, so you can't get to these bolts anymore, so that's why I'm telling you to do that. Other than that, very simple to do here, we'll finish up putting the bolts in this one, we'll take them both over to the base that we already have assembled over here, and see how they go on. Now that I have the upright over next to the cockpit, I pre-installed the T-nuts and pre-installed the centers on them, measured everything out to where it should fit, but we can nudge things around a little bit, no big deal. Now I could have just attached the T-nuts to the bottom of this plate, but if I would have done that, I would have to slide it all the way down to where I needed it. And I'm just guessing where I need it right now. But because of the way these T-nuts are, they don't give me the kind of slideability that spring ball T-nuts do. So I decided just to go ahead and kind of preset them in the position I wanted them in. Anyway, what we're going to do is go ahead and install our flathead bolts. I'm just going to kind of hold this up here. Now, I usually start the top ones first. So I'll kind of get down here and kind of pick up with this hand on the back as I'm trying to get the bolt to go into the T-nut. You kind of feel it around a little bit. Just make sure I keep pressure off of everything. See if I can find that. And I found it. You can see it went in. Then I'll do is come over here to this side. I'll take a look and see where it is. And it looks like it's a little bit shy of where I need it to be. But I can always push it over if I need to. Sometimes you can wiggle it and it'll go ahead and get in there. Like that. I think I got it there. Nope. <laughs> well, wait a minute. Yeah, I do. Right. So now I've got those two. And I don't want to tighten these up, obviously, yet until I get down and see what's going on down here. I'm going to start this one in here. It looks like it's pretty straight on shot. So my measurements were pretty good. Didn't really have to move too much here to make this work. And we got one more left over here. And that one, yeah, it doesn't look too bad either. I think this might work. Again, I might have to take a little pressure off of this so I can get these in. Let's see how that works. I'm going to take my wrench now and follow through. I'm trying to get this thing to screw in, and it is. All right, so I'm not going to get these all the way tight because I still want to be able to, remember, I still have to, and when I'm tightening it up, I'm going to take pressure off of them. I still have to get my bracket in here, the bracket that's going to be holding the wheelbase. And, of course, I'll put my other upright on, but... I want to make sure I have some wiggle room on these, and if I don't, I can always loosen these top ones a little bit. And that'll give me some wiggle room. So I can move it back and forth as I'm putting the wheelbase support bracket in. And yeah, so when we come back, we'll probably be going over the wheelbase bracket and have all this done. Now it's time to get our wheel deck installed. Now that we have our uprights securely mounted, as you can see, this has a bunch of holes in it, and it will accommodate the usual suspects, Thrustmaster, Logitech, Fanatec, and Fanatec it has two different ways to go with Fanatec. Now, this is the front would be facing the driver, so let me flip this around. So the Podium Series, if you guys have those, you know there's multiple holes across the top of them and across the back, so you can actually get five, three here, one here, and one here to hold your Podium to this. Or if you have the regular Fanatec, the triangle pattern, that would be this one, this one, and this one. Now they have these wide ones on the side here, and I was wondering what those were for because they're pretty wide. And I went over and grabbed one of my midge mounts, which could also be a semi-cube mount or a Cole Morgan mount, like this. And you can see it's kind of wide with these flanges hanging off like this. And to my surprise, it actually fit on here holes lined up here and just tilt it this way it came very close in fact this will fit this will fit on here which is a shock to me that you wouldn't have to drill your own holes for this kudos to them for doing that and yeah it's just one of those things i was really surprised to see that you could actually mount a midge motor or like you say a semi-cube that had that kind of a mount so yeah very well done as far as that's concerned i think and uh, this is aluminum by the way this is aluminum plate, 10 millimeters thick. We have some nice aluminum welds in there. 
me show you those. Both sides, very thick welds, very beefy looking stuff there. Slots in there, obviously, for adjusting forwards and backwards, and our angle slots for our angle itself. So what I'm going to do, usually what I do when I put a wheel deck on, or a wheel mount, front mount, whatever it happens to be, is I preload the side of the flange. I'll take the bolt, stick it through here. And by the way, these are going to be the 20 millimeter bolts that come with your kit. So they're 20 millimeters long. You want to make sure you grab those. Of course, they're still M8s, and they're still the metric size of a six millimeter for your wrench. But you stick one of those through there, and I would take the T-nut if it was a spring ball, and just kind of preload it so that when I walk over to the rig, and I'm getting ready to slide this onto, if I can get this going here, there we go. So once I get this over to the rig, I would just take the T-nuts and slide them down the channels and compress the spring ball as I did that. But these are different. And it's not as easy to do that because when you start to slide one of these down the channel, and if you saw me putting on the feet, you, you saw how this works, you have to compress, because we have two wings on this thing, you have to compress one first to get it started. And then as it goes along, the second one's still sticking out. So then you have to stop and then compress the second one to get it in. And they're not easy to compress. They're pretty tight. And as they should be, you want them springy. You want them springing back inside of the channel nice and tight. But, yeah, so it's kind of a hassle trying to do it with these, especially if you've got two of them on here. Now, the directions, another point I want to make here, the directions call for just two of these bolts on each side. And that would be one up there and one in here like this. I'm not real crazy about that. I think what I'm going to do is put two of them on, as long as it spans it enough space then I'll have two at the top for support and then I'll have one in the bottom we've got enough fortunately they gave us like eight of these so that we have enough to get this done and we have enough t-nuts to get it done as far as I can see I haven't run out yet <laughs> so I'm gonna put another one in here even though the directions only call for one on top and one on bottom it's just yeah you want a nice stable stiff wheelbase and just having one in each one of these Seems to me it just gives it too much of an opportunity to twist on us when we're really pushing hard on a high torque direct drive wheel system. But yeah, I'm going to go ahead and go over to the wheelbase uprights, the mounts that support this, and go ahead and pre-install these. And when we come back, we'll be over there, and I'll be kind of holding this up and putting my bolts in, give you guys some shots of that, and see how that goes. So I have the wheel deck mounted now, and I'll show you guys how I did this. I did go ahead and use two bolts at the top, and T-nuts of course, and one for the bottom. And I did that of course on this side too. I was just worried about the twisting action of a wheel deck on this when we're twisting it. Yeah, just having one on the top is just too easy to twist that thing. And because we have this slot on the bottom like this, I'm still able to take this and adjust the angle, as you can see, up or down. And when I put this in, the wheel base uprights here, these guys, I don't have them all the way tight yet. I wanted to make sure that they were kind of loose and shaky because it's easier to get these kind of things in between these uprights if you leave them loose. And yeah, so everything's looking good. Wheel deck is installed. Now what I'm going to do is go make sure that I tighten everything up. You don't want to forget that. First time you put your wheel on, you'll know if these bolts down here are good and tight or not. But we'll go ahead and get all that tightened up and get on to the next segment. Now let's take a look at what we're going to be using for the shifter mount. And we have more parts for the shifter mount than any other part of this chassis. <laughs> so I kind of break this up into two groups because you know, this is the shifter mount plate part. But these three pieces here are really for the, the main mount support. And you don't have to use this, but it's nicely included in the kit if you need to use that. I'm not going to be using that, but I'm going to go ahead and assemble it and mock it up and show you guys what it looks like. But yeah, this is a 320 millimeter long piece of profile here. This is a 40 by 40, which means 40 square, obviously. And you notice the centers are a little bit less beefy than the ones that are in the 120s and the 160s that make up our base over there. This, again, is a 4080, and this will be the main straight piece that comes off of the wheelbase upright mount. Pretty simple how this is going to work. Now, we do have an extra piece here. This is for spacing out and attaching 
this 320 millimeter piece. So this is a spacer. Remember the wheelbase uprights over there have these mounts on them that are 10 millimeters thick that go up against the 160 profiles. So that means that upright is offset from that 160 10 millimeters. So you have to come up with another kind of bracket that is also 10 millimeters thick to attach to this bar so it offsets this bar 10 millimeters so it all lines up straight. Now if they had attached the wheelbase uprights with just corner brackets flush up against the 160 profile, you would not need the spacer. So this is how this works. This is going on like this. This is going to be, let's say our wheelbase upright is over there somewhere. We'll go ahead and push that over there. We're going to be attaching that to the wheelbase uprights with these corner brackets. And these are the corner brackets that have tabs on both sides. There and there, so they're not removed because they're going to be going like this. So we'll have a tab in each one of these profiles, so we don't need to knock them off. And we'll have one up front here, like this, attached to the wheelbase on the top and attached to the wheelbase on the bottom, like so. All right, easy enough so far, but the spacer needs to go onto this piece. And we're going to have to locate the spacer where it bolts to the profile, because remember, once we have this on here, we're going to be bolting this to the profile itself, the 160s that are already over there for the up and down adjustment. And you can see this has countersunk holes in it. We've got a center one, and then flip it around, we've got two countersunks on the other side, and those are the ones that are going to go into the profiles. Now, it won't fit on this profile because it's only a 80, right? 40 by 80. So we need at least a, well, actually, we're going to be attaching it this way so it doesn't matter. So this is the way it's going to mount. It's going to be sitting on here and then mounting to that. Now I'm going to go ahead. I already got a T-nut in here. I'm going to go ahead and put one of these flathead M8 bolts in. And this is a 5 millimeter wrench size on the top. You can see that's a flathead. And of course, that's going to fit nice and neat into our hole there, right? The countersunk hole. So let's go ahead and just mock this up. This will give you a better idea what's going on. Get my 5 mil wrench. And... Once you get this lined up to where you're going to want it, you're going to have to, this is a blind bolt. Just like on the wheelbase mounts, you're going to get a good tighten down on this, a final tighten, but make sure it's located on that 160 profile where it needs to be for the right height for your shifter. And we'll talk more about that once we get to that point. But you can see it's like this. Now this is the side that's going up against the profile like this. Let's get it straight. Definitely want it straight, it won't go on right. So it sits there like this. Then we put two more of the flathead bolts with T-nuts, of course, in the channels and bolt that to whichever channel we want to at the right location on this profile so that the height is right. Then we're going to come back here and we're going to have two more corner brackets bolting this piece to the end of this piece. So we take two more corner brackets and we put them in here like this. All right, pretty easy, right? And of course, there'll be T-nuts in that channel. And it looks like this might interfere with this, but it doesn't matter because this is going to have to be moved if you're going to move it around anyway. And that's one thing I don't like about this blind bolt setup. If it was just corner brackets, it'd be much easier to adjust your height. But chances are most people that get these aren't going to be adjusting the height of the shifter very much. Unlike me, I adjust the heights and take things on and off all the time. So it's a little bit more work for me. But once you have it where you want it, I think most people are going to leave it. Uh, yeah. I think you're rarely going to ever use it as far as having to move things around. So this looks like it might hit this, but it won't because once we have this attached properly to this piece, it's going to be offset because it's going to be sitting up a bit like this. So it'll be clear of that 10 millimeter spacer under there. Simple enough. So once we have that done, then we're going to come in with the tray assembly. And that consists of this bracket. And again, this is 10 millimeter thick aluminum. And it's going to sit like this or like this. And the directions that it has this part pointing towards the rear of the chassis. And I don't really think it makes a difference depending on what you need as far as the location of your tray is probably going to determine that. And you can see it has six holes in it. And of course the slots, the slots are supposed to allow us to adjust it up and down and do angles. So this has six holes in it, as we see. And this plate here has six holes in it on each side. On each side because 
depending on the orientation you need to attach your shifter. Now you notice on each side there's different types of patterns going on here for holes and slots and things like that. Yeah, it's pretty crazy looking with all these holes here. And I'm not sure what this is for as far as a requirement for mounting a shifter, but I'm sure there's some shifter out there that would, can use that. On the bottom of this, we have a support bar going across, just like the pedal tray. And this is all steel. And you can see we've got some welds there, just some tack welds, really, on both sides of it. And then we have some welds, of course, on the ends here on the plate. This is going to go up against the bracket once it's mounted. So it matches up the holes. Let me just do it this way. Like that. And of course we have, we're not going to put six bolts in here. It comes with four. And these are some special button head units. Kind of a flanged button head, I would call this. Because it has the button head dome on it. But it also has this flange, like a built-in washer, if you will. Kind of neat. I like that, actually. Because you don't have to worry about a washer. It's built in. And they give you these serrated nuts. And these nuts have the serrations or teeth, if you will. So they dig into the metal and it acts as a locking type mechanism when it cuts into the metal. <laughs> but it leaves a nasty mark when you take them off, too. Same thing. <laughs> Same time, rather. So, yeah. They give you four of these. So you can put up to four of them. Fill up four of these holes on this plate itself, which should be fine, I guess. But yeah, pretty simple stuff here. They give you enough hardware. I've got the hardware laid out that I'm going to be using. I might have some more bolts, though. I don't have all the bolts out here for the silver ones. But yeah, I think it's going to be pretty easy to get this done. I'm going to go ahead and get it all mounted up, mocked up, and then we'll take a closer look at how it all went together. Now we're going to attach our seat bracket rails to the cockpit. And this, of course, is going to be a very simple matter. These are 500 millimeter long, 40 series, 4040s. Easy enough to do this job. We have four corner brackets. Now, these four corner brackets are in a separate bag. And the reason is they have took off or they snapped off the tabs on one side of these brackets. If you look at the tabs that left on this side, see them sitting there. This one and this one. You can see over here we don't have them. If you look closely here, you'll see that. See where they're broken off at? And it's easy to do that. You just take a screwdriver to get in here on this little piece here. You take a screwdriver and just pop them off or a pair of pliers or something. Now, sometimes they'll leave some residual behind, mostly in the front lip here. Now, we want to get rid of that. See how this is sitting proud a little bit there? I can get this where you can actually see it. Right here on this edge where this piece is, it's sitting up a little bit. Again, let me see if I can get that where you can see it better. There it is. So that's not good. And the reason we, we knock these off, first off, is that this profile is going to be crossing this way on our 40 by 160 spreader pieces. So that means that this will fit in here. It'll fit one way or the other. Let's say this is my spreader piece here, the 160. And I'm laying this across the top of it. The tabs will fit in this channel fine, the anti-rotation tabs. But if I went up against here, because it's perpendicular, the channel is, those tabs will not fit in it. So obviously the solution is to break them off. And that's what they've done here already. And again, this comes in a bag with four of these in it that they've already done. But because it's sitting proud like that, you don't want to put that up against, at least I don't, want to take that and put it up against the profile. It's going to scratch it up. So, easy enough to fix. I've already done one of these. This one here. Just take a file and knock it down. So you can see the silvery part there where the finishes come off. That's me filing that down. So now, if you look at it, you can see it's nice and flat across that top. Nothing sticking up. And that's what you want. Unfortunately, all of these have the same deal. This one, you can see it's sticking up just a bit. And then we have this one over here. And this one is sticking up and it gouged down a little bit. It's funny how these things break off sometimes. See, it's got a gouge in it right there. Because it took the metal with it. <laughs> and then it left this little piece hanging there. So I'll hit the file there. So I'll get all these fixed up before I put them on there. And again, this is a very simple thing to do. I already put in some, which piece did I do that to? There we go. 
I've already put some T-nuts in, one end and the other end. So it's going to sit like this again, crossing those 160s, the front one and the rear one, and sitting like that. And then we'll take our bracket and come in and just do that. Very simple. You can do it on the inside of the rail, or you can do it on the outside of the rail, depending on which side it's on. It really doesn't matter as long as you have it holding it there. So simple enough. I'm going to go ahead and dress the rest of these up. We'll go over, get this mounted on the base, and see how it looks. The seat rails are now mounted to our 40 by 160 spreader pieces. And in the manual, it actually states that these brackets go on the other side. But I always put my brackets on this side of the seat rails. And the reason being, if I ever have to move this seat rail all the way out to the edge over here, then if this bracket's in the way, then I'm going to have to take it off and put it on the other side anyway. I don't think I'll need that much space when I mount my seat. But I built so many of these cockpits that I've learned lessons that, yeah, you might as well go ahead and put it on that side just in case. That way you don't have to take everything off and flip it around and then put it on the other side. So that's just the way I do it. But yeah, this is just an arbitrary distance from each other. I don't know where it's going to need to be until I get my seat over here with the seat brackets attached. But we're going to do that in the second video or part two of this video series, which is going to be the setup video. So that's mounted. Now the only thing left is the shifter mount. Now I have the shifter mount all assembled and attached to where it should be. And it's a very solid piece. And I didn't think it wouldn't be because it's very similar to other 8020 profiles. The only piece that I was a little bit wondering about how it would feel is this piece here. And you can see that I have it assembled with one bolt on each slot, just like in the directions. You could put another one in there, but you have to use 20 millimeter long bolts in this. I'm not sure if there's two more in the pack because of this thick plate that we're using to mount it with, that 10 millimeter thick piece. So yeah, you have to have a 20 millimeter to go through that and still go on the T-nut. But you could put a couple more. But I tell you, after I put this together, I'm going to come around here and show you that we have four of the bolts that have, are in this 10 millimeter plate that are attaching our steel plate. And I can sit here and pull on this thing. Well, I'm going to pull the whole rig around. But let me see if I can put my foot up here and keep it from sliding back. But I'm putting some pretty good pressure on this, and it seems to be pretty sturdy. I'm not crazy about how it hangs off, but I don't think you'll ever feel any flex in this when you're using it. It's pretty stout for the kind of shifters and handbrakes that you would be putting on something like this, I think. Now, the piece that goes down, you can see that I have the corner brackets installed where it attaches to that 4080 that goes to the front. And you see we have our little spacer bracket that's kicking that out on the offset that matches the offset of our brackets on the wheelbase upright supports. And we have a corner bracket on the top and the bottom up here where we're actually connecting to this wheelbase upright. So everything's tightened up, including the wheelbase upright down there. It's very stout. Yeah, this is a, a very stiff assembly. Again, I didn't think it wouldn't be because I have something similar on my rig and it's very solid. So everything's put together now as far as the assembly of the cockpit, except for, as you notice, you can still see the silvery parts of our aluminum extrusions everywhere. So what I'm going to do is go ahead and put all the little beauty caps, I call them, on top of this stuff so it looks all black again. And when we come back, we'll do a final look around at the final result of this prime cockpit from GT Omega. All right, so the build portion of our review on this Prime cockpit is done. And everything went together pretty easily. The profiles are good quality as far as being nice and stiff where it needs to be. This is going to be a very stiff cockpit. I can feel that already. And it should be from the construction that we used on this and, of course, all the parts and the hardware. I'd like to see a shallower profile where we could use spring ball T-nuts because they just they're easier to work with basically even though these work and everything's very solid the wheel deck is very solid once everything's bolted down remember we got everything tightened down now the bottoms of the uprights for the wheelbase support 
are nice and tight so everything's torqued up not all the way because i still have to do the setup part of the video which or the review rather which will be the second part of the two-part review the only thing that is suspect is this pedal tray it's steel and it's kind of thin it's only like three mil and they have one welded piece coming across it but you can it's already actually it's torqued down pretty good right now but it still has that rattle i don't know how well that's going to convey on the audio but which means it's flexible enough i think in the spots here along this piece that goes that they're using it to support it it's flexible enough that in between the welds it's rattling a little bit against that bar at least that's what i think it is because everything is tight trust me it's, everything's torqued down now whether or not it's going to make a difference when i'm using it we'll have to find out once i get a set of pedals on here with a stiff brake pedal pressure based brake pedal and i'll have a nice stiff one on here i guarantee you that because i want to test this and see what it what it'll do i'm a little concerned that it might be a little flexy under use but we'll find that out once we do the setup part of the review We've got all our end caps on, on the profiles. So they really dress up the rig quite nicely. And I'm partial to black. I know a lot of people like the gray stuff, but the black is actually, believe it or not, black anodization on the aluminum is easier to repair than the silver stuff if you get a scratch on it or something like that. But I'll have to do a video on that someday, <laughs> showing you guys how to fix the profile and get rid of those scratches. So everything's done, so we might as well just go ahead and get on to the final thoughts. Final thoughts on the GT Omega Prime Cockpit. This video is part one of a two-part review series of the Prime Cockpit. In the second video, I'll be mounting sim racing hardware components and testing under real-life SRG conditions. Here we have another cockpit made from aluminum extrusions using 40 series profiles. The base is made up of four pieces of 40 by 160 profile which has a heavier core than the rest of the profiles used here. These profiles do have a deeper channel than what I would call industry standard profiles. This allows use of T-nuts that have a metal spring spot welded on the side. This spring helps the T-nuts stay in place. These T-nuts do not operate as smoothly as spring ball T-nuts used in standard 40 series profiles, but they are less expensive to make, which can keep costs down. And they do get the job done. They can be inserted from the profile ends or directly into the profile channels. All of the assembly hardware and fasteners were present, so no trips to the local hardware store required. The assembly process is pretty straightforward, with no surprises or issues. The specialty mounting brackets are well done in 10mm thick aluminum. The wheelbase upright brackets look to be clones of another cockpit manufacturer's brackets, which are known to work very well, as do these in this cockpit's construction. The wheelbase mount is a one-piece aluminum unit. This seems to be very solid once all the bolts are cinched down. The pedal plate is made of 3mm stamped steel. It has a steel tube spot welded to the plate for added support. It has long slots cut into it that should accommodate most common pedal sets out there. It has an angle adjustment that gives a good range. The pedal tray seems to be a bit flexy and has a rattle to it when thumping it with your fist. I will have to wait for a final verdict once I get a proper stiff brake pedal underfoot. The shifter mount is a very solid unit. I'm sure it will be able to handle anything that you can mount to it. While the design of this cockpit looks to be a copy of other available cockpits, I think you have to consider there are not many options when it comes to building a rock solid cockpit using aluminum extrusion as a material for the construct. So I expect to see more familiar looking cockpits from other manufacturers in the future. Now it's time to fit out the prime cockpit and see how it performs under the stress of SRG testing. I'm Barry Rowland. Thanks again for watching the Sim Racing Garage channel. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button. And if you would like to help support what I do here at the SRG, visit my website at simracinggarage.com.